Hello and welcome to Pipe TV, where we extend the experience of getting to know our featured guest up close and personal. tuned in to Pipe TV and I'm Jill Foster. I'm here today with a special guest. He is an actor, singer, and an author of a memoir entitled In a Prior Life. His name is Mr. Richard Pryor Jr. And yes, he is the eldest son of Richard Pryor. So join me in welcoming him. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited that you're here. I'm glad to be here, Jill. Yeah, um, I actually read your book. When I learned that I was going to be interviewing you, right. I said, I need to do some research. I need to learn about who Richard Pryor Jr. is. And I saw that you had dropped the book in April right. of this year. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I have to get it. I went to Amazon. I purchased the book. And I started reading it immediately because it gave me a digital version. Right. That book is phenomenal. Thank you. It is a page turner. Thank it's you. It's very intriguing. Um, the name, In a Prior Life, I assumed naturally that you were going to be speaking a lot about your father. While you do speak of him and address him throughout the book, it's about you yes, and your life. definitely. And boy, you had some trials and tribulations. Oh, yeah. Ups and downs, miracle rounds. Oh, I mean, yeah. You went through some stuff in the book. Definitely. And as a fan of your father, not really knowing you per se, you know, you assume that a person who has his type of celebrity and his genius and, you know, the comedic genius that he was, I see him on television you you just automatically assume that you, as his son, had a white picket fence growing up. Right. And so when I started reading the book and I started to see all of the things that you went through, I was like, wow. So I'm going to start off by saying, why did you write this book? What well, was your purpose of putting <clears throat> that on you? Well, I think it was... It was Two, like a two-edged sword. It was two different things. When I first started the book, it was like writing of the things I went through, mm -hmm. being the child of a celebrity. Right. By the time I was almost finished with the book, it had turned into something else. It was about how can I help someone mm -hmm. who's gone through some things in their life, mm -hmm. who feel that there's nothing but darkness in front of them. How can I help somebody with my book and my story and the things I've gone through? Right. Because like you said, most people think that you know, white picket fence and, you know, the silver spoons hanging there and all that, and they think that's all they know about your life and think that's accurate, and yes. it's really further from the truth. Yes. So, it, you know, it was showing people what I've actually gone through and hopefully it could help somebody. Yeah, yeah. And I also, I find this kind of humorous that your, your name, Richard Pryor Jr., but that wasn't your original name. Can you explain that? Uh, it sounds yeah. a little strange, yeah. I'm sure, well, to everyone else. Well, when I was born, my mother always wanted to name me after her cousin, mm -hmm. whose name was Rodney. So when I was born, my mother named me Rodney Clay Pryor. Mm -hmm. So since I was a preemie, I weighed two pounds, three ounces. I had to stay in the hospital until I gained up to five pounds. Mm -hmm. And my mother came up to see me like almost a month later, went up to visit me. and. You know, I like to see how my son, you know, Rodney Clay Pryor is doing. And they were like, we have no Rodney Clay Pryor. And she's <laughs> like, what? We have a Richard Pryor Jr. And my father had secretly went up to the hospital and changed my name. Mm -hmm. And he told me years later, when I was probably about 17, he said, if he ever would have known he was famous, would be famous, he wouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. And did he give you a reason why he said that? Because he knew what went along with that, the mm -hmm. name. He knew right. what he went through, so he knew that I was going to go through it and the things that I'd have to endure, not knowing who your friends are, not knowing that people were being honest with you, right. uh, just not being able to be yourself around people mm -hmm. um, because of what the name, you know, what, what the name holds. Mm -hmm. So writing a book, was there things in it that you struggled with, or did it just kind of fall out? I struggled with a lot of things in the book. I, I think it was um, therapeutic. Mm -hmm. It was at times when I would get physically ill during the times of writing the book. Because when you're writing a book and you're recording, because I recorded, I would re talk about it, talking to a recorder. Mm -hmm. 
So a lot of times when you're recording something, you're talking about a certain things and then all of a sudden your mind opens up and something else that you forgot about or you suppressed comes up right. and you're like, oh, wait a minute, this right. really happened. So then you start talking about that and then that opens the door up to something else. Right. And then you're like opening these doors and you're going on this roller coaster ride while you're doing it. And I would, there was times I would actually really get physically ill yeah. and have to actually sit back and stop um, recording or anything, focus on it, period. And my manager would have to, you know, push me, come on, you know, you got to do this, you got to get it done. But it was a very difficult process to go through. Right, right, because I read the book, so I understand. I'm not going to get into a lot of the minute details because it is for purchase. Yeah. And I want people to have that um, great experience that I had with it being a page turner and reading it for themselves and enjoying it for themselves. Good, Thank But you. I do understand that... Um, you have, it's seven of you guys as siblings. Actually six of us. Six, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, so six of you guys, including you. Right. It's six. Yeah, three okay. boys and three girls. Okay, all right. So when you decided to write this book, did you share with, it, are you close with any of your siblings? And did you share that you had this thought to write this book? Well, yeah, I talked to my sister Rain quite a bit because mm -hmm. we, we communicate almost daily. So I really talked to her a, a lot. When I first did the first proposal of the book, I talked to her and she was like, just make sure you make it your voice. And that's why I went to the thing of recording it. Yes. Because when I would record and Ron Brar, the guy that helped write it with me, he would hear my voice and my tone and he could actually, he got so that he listened to me so much he could tell when I was recording something if it was upsetting me mm -hmm. and if it was hurting me. So he would write that into the book. So it was a way to get my voice into that. I wanted people to be able to go through this and picture and visualize everything mm -hmm. that they were reading. They could actually see it. And mm -hmm. that's what I wanted. And I, I think I, I came up with that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, so your, your siblings didn't have any input to what you were saying other than the fact that they yeah. wanted you to just have it in your voice. Yeah, just my voice and tell and, my story. Right. And you tell my story. And... No one can tell my story but me. So, okay. you know, Rain has written a book previously. She had a book out, uh, Jokes My Father Never Taught Me. And it was her story. It was her voice, her story. Okay. And so my mine was my story. I think the important thing was of being able to write this as far as me doing it is because I was the eldest child. And I think it was a really important thing for the eldest child to actually write a book. Mm -hmm. and tell his story and his journey, his or her, whoever it was, yeah. tell their journey, what they went through um, with someone who wasn't famous at first. Right. Because all of my other siblings, he was already in the business. Yes. And with myself, he was not in the business. Right, yeah. right, that was the difference, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So um, your dad, you weren't with your father a lot throughout your life, but you you did spend a lot of time with him. Mm -hmm. At times, you you were raised primarily by your mother, right? And you would go and you would stay with him in the summers and 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 go visit with him for long periods of time, right? Um, I found in the book that you guys had a bond, mm -hmm. a really strong bond. And um, I just wanted to get your perspective on how close you were to your dad and why, if you were close with him, and what, what made you have that closeness to right. him. So can you explain anything? Well, I, I think the thing with my dad, first of all, is I never looked at my dad like other people mm -hmm. looked at him. Uh, people say, well, what's it like having a father like that? I really couldn't tell you mm -hmm. because I look at my dad like he worked at a factory mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. the way I see him. I don't see him the way everyone else sees him. So it was really nice, you know, being around him, you know, touring with him. When I was younger, I used to introduce him on stage and wow. all those things. Mm -hmm. So it was like a great experience, mm -hmm. but getting to know the person off the camera and it's totally different than the person that everyone else saw. People, you know, think, you know, that he's around the house telling jokes 24-7 and all that. And right. he was nothing like that. My dad was an introvert. I'm an introvert. Mm -hmm. Very soft-spoken. I'm soft-spoken. So a lot of the characteristics I had, it was, it was like he just gave them yeah. to me, you know. Right. Right. I mean, part, part of me into you. Mm -hmm. So it was like that uh, uh, coming up with him, but being able to spend time with him and do things with him and travel with him and... Um, 
messing up and doing the bad things I shouldn't be doing and all those things, I was always able to go to him. Yeah. Even the times when I didn't think I could do that, I was right. able to do that, that he was always there. Yeah. He may not agree with it, yeah. but he was always there. Yeah, and I saw that when reading the book. I, I, even though, you know, it, it almost appeared as if you got away with murder with your dad at times. You know, you could do whatever you sometimes, want. Sometimes, yeah. Right? Yeah. So well, I think I sometimes I think sometimes I got away with it because I think sometimes he didn't know, because okay. a lot of times when you're coming up and you're staying with Dad, you know, if he's doing a show or something like that, he's oh, yes. he's doing his own thing, mm -hmm. and we knew, you know, his his, his drug life and everything is no mm -hmm. secret. So he's doing his own thing, and I'm doing my own thing because all I have to answer to is a housekeeper or something. Yeah, yeah. You know, so yeah, you have free will. Yeah, you, so you sometimes <laughs> you did some stupid things. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing that um, you hung out a lot with your uh, family, your mm -hmm. siblings, and and I related to this part of the book because I grew up in the projects in, in Newark mm -hmm. with my um, aunt and her five children at the time and she had my mother's three children and we lived on the 12th floor in the projects and we would put on plays. I remember we put on a play Mama's Dead and you know my cousin singing Mama's Dead never again would she <laughs> my hand yeah. and he was he would beat us up and make us cry you know like y'all better cry you know that oh, sort yeah. of thing. You know, so I related to those fun times that, that you had so when when you were with your siblings, yeah. you know? And, um, you know, so there's one thing with that and looking at what you wrote in the book, it paralleled to my life a little bit as well because we all have skeletons in our closet. Mm -hmm. And as we grow up and we come into our, ourselves, and we're living a good life and we don't look like what we went through and we have jobs and we've had children and we're living a good life now we're a part of society and we don't tend to pull those bones out of the closet right we just keep them back pushed in mm -hmm. the back yeah so I want you to know that I am amazed that you had the transparency the spitzpa to, mm -hmm. to be able to write this and to share it with the public because I think that all of us have, you know, something that we need to release. And I really can relate to you saying yeah. that, um, you know, it when you started writing, things started coming yeah. and, oh, and, yeah. and it was, it was kind of heavy. Yeah. But um, with that, um, I just wanted to get that out. Yeah. I just wanted well, I to think say, it's, it's, and that's why people need to get this book. Yeah, because I think it's, a, it's important, especially in our African-American community. Yes. We don't talk about stuff. We sure don't. We know that there's a mess going on. We know that uncle's doing this. Mm -hmm. We know that auntie's doing that. We know that grandma's doing this. We know the brother's doing this. Mm -hmm. We know that that brother's gay and doing his own thing, and mm -hmm. he's singing in the church, and doing everything else, whatever he's doing, we know all those things. Right. But for us to step up and talk about it, that so-and-so is gay, so-and-so is, is messed up, so you know so-and-so messes with them kids, you know, mm -hmm. all those things, if we bring those up, it's taboo. Right. It's automatically, you know, we don't, we don't talk about that. We don't discuss those things. We don't bring those things out. We keep it like this. But what happens with that is that people who are sick don't get better. That's right. People that are going through in their mind, it don't get better because it's, oh, that's uncle so-and-so's. You know how he is. Right. He is crazy. And instead of dealing with the things that we go through and learning to say that it's okay to have mental illness, it's okay to have depression, it's okay to go through this, and these situations that we go through in our lives like everybody else goes mm -hmm. through. Right. We need to have a voice and someone to be able to say, hey, I went through all these things. Right. Like my book, I stated how... You know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I wanted to tell it all. Absolutely. And you did. Yeah. And you did. And and for those folks out there who think about, you know, you know, they want to, st they have a white picket fence type of mentality in life. And, you know, they'll be like, oh my God, oh my God. When I read this book, I said, this brother is so real. Oh my goodness. 
I just, when you walked in, when I greeted you today, I just felt close to you. Yeah. Because you, you've you been so real with yeah. um, putting your life out. In but even, even with that white picket fence, after mm -hmm. a while it starts to fray and starts to tear apart. That's right. So you That's may right. have a white fence, but as time goes along, it starts to peel and to blister and all those things. So Yeah, and this book is freeing for those who are keeping those bones in the closet. Right. They read this book, they're going to relate, and it's going to be freeing for them. I That's hope why so. I hope that everyone, you guys hear me, go get this book. You'll enjoy it. So there was a part in the book where I found, that I found humorous, and I was laughing because you had ran away and you were singing this song, Don't Nobody Care About Me, Don't Nobody Love Me. Oh, yeah, you got it yeah. a little backwards, but I'll, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm going to because I can, yeah. it's uh, still in my head. Don't nobody love me. Don't yeah, nobody care. Nobody. Okay, okay. Yeah. What do, <laughs> I, I was always dramatic. <laughs> I'm just going to throw it out there. Yeah, and there was the something, there was, <laughs> there was something that I can't remember exactly what it is right off the, the thing that I wanted, but I would always have this thing where I would say, well, don't nobody love me. And I got into it one day, and it was like the afternoon, my aunt was over and my mother at my mom's house. And I got into it so much, I couldn't even get myself out of it. <laughs> I mean, it was, I got so deep into Don't Nobody Love Me, and it started into a cry, and I started crying. And while I'm crying, I'm still saying it. So it was like, Don't Nobody Love Me. Don't nobody care. <laughs> and I was going on for so long till my mother just yelled out, you're right. Don't nobody love you. Don't nobody care. So I was like, I'm running away. Mm -hmm. So I get my stuff, what I could take, because, you know, I didn't buy nothing, so you ain't taking too much out of here. Right. And I go around to the pool hall where my great-grandmother had a pool hall, and mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to hide in her car until somebody comes in, they're going to be looking for me. Yeah. No one ever came. <laughs> no. <laughs> and you got hungry. No one <laughs> looked for me. Nobody. I, and I, I remember, like, raising up, peeping, like, you know, like, looking out the window. Is anybody coming? Nobody. And I, I mean, I stayed like that for until it started getting dark. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I was like, I'm getting hungry, so. Yeah. 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 So and I your mom just welcomed my, you yeah, back. Yeah, tucked my like, tail okay. and went right. back on it. Right. I was, yeah. <laughs> So I can see, even with that um, incident that occurred, that you were, in a sense, crying out. I, I believe that you were crying out because mm. uh, for attention, because, I, I mean, let's face it, your father was getting all kinds of attention. I mean, you knew that he was somebody. Right. And I can see how that could be, like, you know, you want to... That and a little spoiled because yeah. I was my mother's only boy. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, when you're the oldest and the first one. Right, and, right. You know, and then I, that was when my I had another sister under me, Tammy, and then mm -hmm. I had, a, my mother just had my little sister, Elanda. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. hey, what's going on here? You know, I'm not the center of attention anymore. So, right. yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. So did you, um, some of the things that you got involved in, on a more serious note, was it, do you think that you tried certain things because, uh, well, I know part of it was your experiences that you went through as mm -hmm. a child, um, but um, some of the choices that you made throughout, uh, was it was it that you were seeking attention or you just, just like to do what you wanted to do? I mean. I think at the time when you're going through certain things in your life, mm -hmm. you think you're doing almost everything you're doing is because I just want to do it. Right, okay. I just want to have fun and I just want to do this. Mm -hmm. In retrospect, when you look back on it and things that you go through in life, mm -hmm. and you, when you can sit back and you out of the, when you're out of the fog, you can sit back and you look at it, you're like, I was hurting. Mm -hmm. I was hurting and, mm -hmm. and yeah, I had, may have had fun doing this or mm -hmm. you know, in, enjoying this when I was doing this drug or whatever it was I was doing. Right. But you learned why you were doing that. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. whether it was for attention, whether it was like finding people who were like-minded just like you. Because what we tend to do is when we're going through something in our mind and we're like really like this, we want to find the exact same person that's just like that. We want to find the exact found it in your dad. Yeah. yeah, found it in my dad. We want to find the exact same thing so that we can like pull together and we feel the same way, 
We woe is me the same way. We were all hurt the same way. We were struggled this way. We were abused this way. And it's a cycle. And right. we fall into it and we grab a hold of it and we take it for what it is. Right, right. But when you come out of that and able to look at it and when you like step back and you're like, man, I was so sick in my mind and hurting so bad mm -hmm. that I was willing to do this or yeah. I was willing to do that. Yeah. Just to feel something mm -hmm. and someone to understand what I was going through and say, it's okay to get high because you're going through this. Yeah. And that was like a thing with me reaching out with like my dad at the time I was sh shooting coke in my yeah. yeah. And yeah. I'm calling him up and I'm like, dad, guess what I just that did? And he's like, what right. son? And I just shot coke in my arm and he's like, it'll be okay. And it, it infuriated me because he didn't get upset. Right. And then when I looked back on it years That's later, I was, out yeah. Help. But he was high at the same time too. Yeah, he was. You know, he but was. I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing the fact that why isn't he responding the way I want him to respond? Right. I want right. a reaction out of that. Right. I yeah. deserve a reaction, mm -hmm. and I didn't get it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you, um, you know, you you realized that you were attracted to young men growing mm -hmm. up, and um, I. This is another time that I actually laughed a lot through this book because it was kind of humorous the way you wrote it out. Mm -hmm. I know it's a serious situation. But even when you got mad when you were called Lionel by your mom, oh my God. that was hilarious to me. Yes. It would, if you would have seen my face when I finally <laughs> saw what Lionel looked like. <laughs> my, my, my mother said, you mean, she, I would do something, she'd be like, sit down, Lionel. Yeah. And all the time, and I'm like, and you know, you wonder, what's a Lionel? First, <laughs> and then, then when you get a little older, who's Lionel? Yeah. When I saw Lionel. <laughs> One time. Explain who Lionel was. Lionel was my mother's hairdresser. Right. <laughs> I didn't know this, mm -hmm. but I remember being at the church one time, New Morning Star Baptist Church, and I remember looking up there and this man with his bandana <laughs> wrapped around with all the, the colors in the hair <laughs> and they're hanging on the side. Mm -hmm. I was so upset. Yeah. I was like, that's Lionel. Yeah. My mother has been calling me this. <laughs> this is. And you were hurt. Oh, I you was. You were devastated. If you would have saw Lionel, you would have been hurt too. Yeah. Yeah. You were I devastated. was hurt. <laughs> yeah, you I was. Devastated. Oh, I was devastated. And so, um, <laughs> but you did everything in your power to um, to not reveal that you had an attraction to right. to men. Right. On the flip side, that's right. what you did, and to the point where you joined the Navy. Yeah. I thought that was And gonna, you were just walking into the celebration. I thought that was going to make me a man. I got there and they said, welcome to the Miss America, the ship. I was like, uh-oh. It was like, exactly. it was it yeah. was on like Donkey Kong. Oh. It was, I had never seen anything yeah. like that in my life because mm -hmm. I was on a ship and there's like 5,000 guys on my aircraft carrier. Yeah. That's before they were co-ed. And it was like, this is like a red light, this just like my great grandmother's house. <laughs> you had the guys, you know, dressing in there, they got their little, yeah. their little short towels wrapped around them at the video arcade machine mm -hmm. and looking at everybody and cruising. And I was like, man, mm -hmm. yeah. Don't ask, yeah. don't tell. Yeah. So, um, and that's what led to you coming out to your parents, mm -hmm. and and they were very accepting. Um, yes, I, I yeah yeah, your yeah mom I had a my, moment, yeah but, she had her moment yeah, yeah but, but I didn't I you know when you go through things in life you know I you think a lot of times when you're in something that you're stuck in something and you're there when I look back on my life now mm -hmm. as far as the things I've gone through even the people I slept with and chose to be with and all those things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I look at what happened prior to that and the the uh, the, the men that. Uh, sexually abused me and all those things and yes. how that was so pre prevalent in my life mm -hmm. and how it made an impact yep. on the decisions yeah. that you make when you go through things like that it makes it creates decisions for you and a road for you that maybe you don't want to go down yes. and maybe you didn't realize you were going down and why you're going down those roads right right yeah yeah and and that's true i, I found that because you also um you know you went from you know, sleeping with um, the same sex, and you did wound up getting married. Mm -hmm. um, you were almost married once, once before, before, but that led to you yeah. joining the service. And yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, 
you married and you actually have a son. Yes. His, his name is Randis, right? Mm, right? And how old is Randis? Randis is 28 years old. 28 years old? Okay. Yeah, more than time. Okay, and how's your relationship with your oh, son? Oh, great. That's wonderful. Yeah, I actually saw him before yeah. I came here. He was like, where are you going, Dad? I'm like, yeah. interview. Yeah. So, yeah, that's my that's my little, that's my little, that's still my little bitty boy. Mm -hmm. I still look at him as a little kid and everything. It's kind of hard to not look yeah. at that, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but it's, uh, I mean, I've been through some things and learned some things and, you know. You have, and you actually, um, you actually uh, forgave at the end of the book. And I want to make sure, I want to ask this question. Okay. To anyone, although when you forgive someone, you forgive them. Right. Even if they don't forgive you. But I'm just curious for myself. Has anyone apologized to you? Anyone in your family or anybody ever? No. No? No. But that's great that you, yeah. no, you they apologized they and you forgave them. Right. Well, you didn't apologize, but you forgave well, them. You, but you know what it is? You. In order to go on with your life. Right. And to feel better about yourself, mm -hmm. it's not about that person saying, oh, I'm so sorry I did this. Mm -hmm. If you're forgiving them, you're forgiving them. Mm -hmm. But it's about you being able to go on with your life and to, to better yourself. Mm -hmm. Whether they ever acknowledge it or not, which some of them won't. Right. And some of them never will. Right. But I can't focus on that and giving all that energy to uh, negativity. Right. and how they treated me and how this person hurt me and how this person abused me. I can no longer do that because it dictates, they're then dictating my life right. and my journey. Yes. And I have to dictate my own journey in my own life. Yes. And I'm glad that you said that because um, that's a sure sign of just loving yourself mm -hmm. and just loving in general. And that's how you ended your book, which was wonderful and the dedication to your mom. So, again, I enjoy you being here. Thank you for having me. I'm, I can go on and on having a conversation with you because there's a lot more in this book, and I yeah. want people to um, to buy this book. Yes, please um, buy the book. There is, outside of the book, you are an actor, and you're also a singer. Can right. you enlighten some us folks on what you're doing in that lane and what's coming up for you and okay. the things to try to sure. before we wrap up? Sure, I'm actually, right now, I'm working on a, there's a play called The Interrupted Journey. I'm actually working with that now, and the uh, is co-starring with my, myself and uh, Sashi Parker, who is Shirley MacLaine's daughter. Oh, and it's okay. based off a true story of Betty and Barney Hill. Mm -hmm. And it happened in the early 60s, mm -hmm. and what it was about was that they went on a trip and they lost like two hours. Mm -hmm. uh, they couldn't remember, and they went to a psychiatrist, and they told the exact same story wow. about being abducted. Wow. So it's a play about that, and we're actually doing, and I'm playing the husband, and she's playing my wife, mm -hmm. and the thing, and it's actually, a, the actual tapes from the recording, we're actually doing the exact lines from that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm working on that. I'm actually working on this. I want this as a show okay. in a prior life, and also the guy, Ron Brower, who in helped. Front row. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And Ron Brower right now is actually working on the screenplay right now. We have okay. some productions that are interested in this as a uh, feature film. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. I would love to hear you sing too. Oh yeah. Because um, you know, I know that you can um, you can drop the mic on folks. Just an old sweet song keeps Georgia on my mind. Georgia. earlier on when I greeted you that you are in the choir at your church mm -hmm. and can you talk about what you're doing with the church now? Well I'm just uh, actually the, the church is an interesting thing is that my ex-wife is now my pastor mm -hmm. and uh, th wow. that shows you how things can change in life how directions can change people you couldn't stand and people you actually really just hated mm -hmm. and how 
God can turn those things around wow. if you allow that yeah. to happen. Yeah. But I'm, you know, I'm the head of my praise and worship team um, in church. I do that. Um, but other than that, then singing on stage and performing. You know, I do cabaret. I'm a Mac nominated cabaret performer here in New York City. Yes. So I do that as well. And what's your, you have a name, right? Your do, Richard Pryor Jr. Richard Pryor Jr. Oh, you go under Richard Pryor oh, Jr. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that was, I don't that know. Was the, back that was the drag queen. That was the, yeah. yeah. We don't, she was fierce. Thank you. <laughs> she was fierce and she looked good. Thank too. you. I have to tell you. Yes, she's yeah, in the book, yeah. 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 She was, she's a pretty thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so I just want, um, what church do you go to? Do you want people to Yeah, know? I go to a church. It's called Promise Bay, Promise Cat. We're under Pilgrim Assemblies. And uh, the head church is in Brooklyn on um, Central Avenue. And Pastor DeBoer uh, Crow is the pastor. Used to be uh, uh, Roy Brown used to be the uh, pastor of it, and he passed away, and he passed it on to her. So we're underneath that umbrella. Okay. Okay. So is there anything else you want to be able to share with um, the well, audience? Well, the viewing audience. Uh, if you know of anybody who's into uh, some darkness in their life and they're struggling and they're going through and they're hurting and they're in a lot of pain and they don't see a way out, whether it's addiction or the way they're carrying themselves, the way they don't care about anything and they see no hope and they're depressed and all those things, get this book for them. Allow them to read the book or share this with them if you can or gift it to someone or, or um, a community center, a homeless center, or anything, if you could gift this book to somebody, anybody, and have them actually really read the book and seeing that you can come out of the darkness that you think that you have to stay in. Well, thank you very much. Thank I think you. that that's good advice, and I back it 100%. Thank you so I much. I agree. Thank you. I'm Jill Foster, and you've been tuned into Pipe TV. I want to thank Richard Pryor, Jr., for being in the studio with me today. Um, make sure you get his book. I tell you it's a per page turner and you heard it from his mouth to your ears that this book can save a life and help others. So make sure you pick up a copy for yourself. You won't be sorry. Again, this has been Pipe TV. Thanks for joining us. Jolly Branches is his dream, apparently. And, and <laughs> right, yeah. So <laughs> basically, for everybody who has a dream, and you know, so let this song inspire you. Let this song, you know, let you want to go forth and follow your dreams. Okay. So shout out to Carvin and Ivan. Ooh, yes. Ethical Records for producing and writing this song. So here we go. All right.
Hello and welcome to Pipe TV. I'm your host, Kerry D. Singleton, and today I have the pleasure of welcoming an iconic individual, Miss Allison Williams Foster. How are you? I'm fantastic, thank you. You look awesome, too. Thank you. Good, thank good, you. good, good. Welcome to the show. Um, so you, not only are you, you have all of these hats, that's why I use the word icon. Um, you're the CEO and founder of iStyle Management, and that's really what I want to start off with in this conversation is that you transcended from being an artist to uh, taking on management. Yes. What is that like for you? Well, I'll tell you what's interesting. Um, I have children, mm -hmm. and while I was a performer, I had a baby. Okay. And my son was in a commercial with me, and I became a backstage mom. Okay. And so from being a backstage and mom, I became a manager during that period of time, but made it official. By default. By default. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I used to manage artists myself, and it's, I, I never really enjoyed much of it, to be honest. Is it, uh, is it a tough transition to make to being a full-fledged a CEO and founder of a management company? It can be, you mm -hmm. know, it, it really can be. Uh, there's moments where I still want to be performing, I <laughs> and, I, right. and I do, yes. but it, it can be tough when um, you're, you're trying to help somebody cast a, a project and you don't have the talent that you need or right. finding the talent yeah. that you really want or the talent that will appreciate the craft, Correct. you know, so yeah. that that's the tough part about it, and it's ongoing. It's not like a nine to five. It's just forever. Yeah, yeah. When you're sleeping, <laughs> it's you're working. Forever. Yes, yes, that's I know. Right. So let's 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 take it back a, a bit. Let's 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 uh, do some throwback. Well, Wednesday. Okay. Shall we? Sure. Um, uh, your debut was uh, the with the Wiz yes. on Broadway yes. with Miss Stephanie Mills. Yes. I gotta ask because I'm such a big Stephanie Mills fan. What is it like to work with her? Stephanie and I had an awesome relationship. Oh. It was fun. We are still friends to mm -hmm. this day. Um, it was a great, great time, and I enjoyed work. She's super talented. Yes, she is. You know, so it was a fabulous experience for me. And yeah. so, and so, what is it? What what, what role did you have? On, on the stage. I was the tornado eye. Wow. I was the storm. And I he still carry that name. the eye of the storm. I was the eye of the storm. So yeah. what was it like uh, performing uh, on Broadway must have been a magical moment for you, yeah. especially at the, at the infancy stage of your career. Yes, it was exciting because I'm a little girl from Harlem from mm -hmm. the projects and it was a dream. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to live that out every night and to do it live for people was I, I, it, amazing for me, you know, wow. to, to have that dream come true. And every night was different, so right, it was right, right. spectacular. It was, that must have been awesome yeah. for you. And got, you did Guys and Dolls and Dream Girls. Yes. Uh, I, I want to ask you a question, um, and I know this might be a hard question for you to answer, but of all of the projects that you worked on as, in terms of your Broadway uh, yes. uh, career, what would you say was the most magical for you? 
Wow. It has to be The Wiz. The mm. Wiz was the most magical, although I had a, a creative part on Dreamgirls. Right, right. So that was, that was new for me and that was exciting. But it, it was The Wiz because it was nothing like that during that period of time, right, 75, right. 76, 7, uh, that was new to Broadway. So to see that kind of life come to life in an all-black show was just... Now, the, the theater best. version did precede the movie, right? Yes. Right. Yes. So, uh, so you were doing this on Broadway before Diana Ross and Absolutely. Michael Jackson yes. and Richard Pryor. Yes. So, okay, so how did that feel once it became uh, a, a, a blockbuster movie? Uh, it was exciting. I was also casted for the movie, but wow. then I was working. They said the movie happened during the time that the Broadway show was still on oh, Broadway. Oh, it was concurrent. I didn't yes, know that. Okay. Yes. Okay. And so it was like, don't you leave, right. Tornado Eye. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> you know, so I didn't shoot the, do the movie, but um, it was nice to know that I was at the bottom and the foundation of the project. Now, also, being that you're from Manhattan, from Harlem, and 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 being on Broadway, I mean, being so close to home, what was that like? Did you, did did all your family from uptown come support? And what was it like, you know, to 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 be so close to home on 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 the big stage? It was interesting because I had family that wasn't family. Of course, everybody's <laughs> everybody your was my family, yeah, right? Exactly, cousin, right? exactly. Mm -hmm. But it was exciting because I was leaving the show and going back to the projects until I was wow. able to get my own apartment. You know wow. what I mean? And so it, it I mean. It kept me grounded. Talk about having two feet in two different worlds, yeah, huh? Yeah, yeah. Wow. But it was wow. it was a great experience because it did keep me grounded. Now, talking about great experiences, uh, most of us, including myself, grew up on Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. um, I was born in the 70s, so I remember Sesame Street when it was really Sesame Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were one of the uh, original singers on the theme song? Yes. And must I tell I you, I... Even... Okay. come about yeah um they found me singing in church mm. i was in a church choir and a woman walked into the church mm -hmm. and she sat and watched and she picked several children and i was one of the children that they picked took me down to radio city um the studio wow. and i recorded the theme song and the number five you have had such an extraordinary journey from the very beginning who's your favorite sesame street character i don't have one. you don't have one no I have to, mine is definitely Kermit. Is it The really? faces. Is it? The faces that he would make when he was going through it with Miss yeah, Piggy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, yeah. those, those are my favorite. Uh, and and uh, you started off with Sesame Street and, and, and you worked with Stephanie Mills and, and did so many great things on Broadway. But then you went on to work with iconic individuals like Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder, Bobby Brown. What was that like working with Stevie? Let's start with him. Ooh. Wow, Stevie was right out after The Wiz, and mm. um, this was during the songs of, uh, in the Key of Life. Correct. I toured with him, and wow. we went to Nigeria first, and then we did Satellite, did the Grammys, and wow. Stevie, I mean, I learned so much, and he's so super talented, and of course, another moment in my life where I'm like, is this really right, happening? Right, I'm right. like Stevie Wonder, you know. Right. So it was another fabulous experience um, very early in my career. And one would say that that was uh, like the pinnacle of his career. Yes. Not that it has really plateaued, yes. but, you know, what are some of the things that you learned um, from working with Mr. Wonder directly? I watched how he worked with people. Mm -hmm. um, always genuine, as Michael. Jackson the mm -hmm. same, always genuine, always courteous, always concerned, um, not, it wasn't always about him, right. fun, funny, laughing, right. and I watched how he intermingled, but he took care of business, Okay, you know, and that, that's something that I took away. Professionalism, professionalism and humility. Yes. Michael Jackson, what was it like to work with him? Same thing, professional humility. See, yeah. a lot of fun. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. A, a child. Yeah. You know, he was like yeah, a child. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was getting. Yeah. 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 What, what part of his career did you two work together and to what capacity? Early on, um, got me working day and night. That uh, Yeah, I was a dancer wow. at that time. So I did a couple of right. live shows with him as a dancer. So what was it like dancing with Mike? Crazy. <laughs> Is he like, no, let's he's do it over. He's a perfectionist. Yeah. yeah, he's mm -hmm. a perfectionist. I mean, everything down to your finger, your chin, the head movements, everything. Perfection. Mm -hmm. But um, very kind in, you know, putting it together and kind and considerate with you getting it. And I imagine probably very, very warm spirit. And very warm. 
Yeah. Yeah. I've always thought that. Bobby Brown and I are both from the same part of Boston, Roxbury. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually very close to uh, several of his family members. Um, at what point in his career did you work with him and to what capacity? Okay. Bobby Brown, I was a background singer. Okay. And this was recent. This was like 2007, 8, 9. Okay. Yeah. And then again in 2010. Okay. So uh, he called me in to do some background work for some life. Live performances. What are some of the songs you do back We did for? all of the new edition stuff. Really? And, yeah, we did all really? of that stuff. And I had the pleasure of choreogra re choreographing it for the background. And he's singers. definitely a perfectionist himself. A lot of people do not give him the credit that I feel that he deserves for being such a perfectionist when it comes to his staging. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And a gentleman. Very which nice people guy. don't know. Yeah. Um, Neo. That was recent as well, to yeah. 2012 mm -hmm. with Neo. Yeah. And what was it like working with him? Because he's a newer artist. He doesn't have the legacy of Michael and, and Stevie and Bobby yet, you know. So what was it like working with him after you've had all this experience with all these legends? Um, close to the same. Neil was very quiet during mm -hmm. that period of time. Okay. Um, he was very quiet, a lot to himself. And um, I didn't get to mingle with him as much as the other artists. Okay. Um, so there was a little separation there. Even though I did background and we were on the stage together, mm -hmm. they, he was still a little bit more to himself. A little different. Yeah, a little type different of type person. of yeah. Right. Yeah, but you could see a, a gentle person. I mean, I mean, in the work atmosphere, mm -hmm. but a little more to himself. Now, believe it or not, I used to be a dancer. I'm a huge Janet Jackson fan, you know okay, her, Urban yes. Mission album just turned 30 years old. Wow. Um, and so choreography was always something that I was into, especially as a kid. Um, her Rhythm Nation project was choreographed by a gentleman named um, Anthony Thomas. Mm -hmm. And I got to meet Anthony Thomas a couple of years ago uh, in Hollywood. He actually did the 54321 thing with me. Um, so as a choreographer, you worked with with uh, George Faison. Yes. And for the Cosby Show, I want to talk about that. Like, okay. which scene? Most of us are familiar. Most of us with melanin are mm -hmm. familiar with every single episode of the Cosby Show. Mm -hmm. So which uh, which scene did you uh, assist with the choreography for? Okay, I don't know if you remember this particular scene is when the family went out, okay. the mother and father, the Huxtables were out of the house, okay. and um, their son, I can't even remember his Theo. name. Theo. Was his, Theo his, threw a party at the house. Okay. I don't know if you remember that. I'm Theo thinking. threw a party and everybody's dancing and they break the table and it, it was, uh -oh. yeah, it was, it, it was a, Claire was it hot. was a house party. <laughs> <laughs> it was a house party. Mm -hmm. So I choreographed that scene with wow. George Faison. That must have been such. A, so did you get to meet uh, the, the 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 entire cast? I got to meet Theo. Well, Theo, I have a son that was an actor, so my son was on his show, and then my son did a different world. So I, oh, okay. I got to meet him several times, and and uh, Bill Cosby. Okay. But never anybody else on the show. Is uh, is uh, Malcolm Jamal Warner? I know that as a young person. Young Malcolm Jamal Warner versus an older one, at least professionally speaking, seems to have, have been different just because on The Cosby Show he was an actor and then yeah. later in, on The Malcolm and Eddie Show, it was his show. Uh, what was it like working with him? In I terms really, of his professionalism. Yeah, I didn't spend a lot of time around him because I was kind of off to the side with Doing Bill that. and and yeah okay. and George Faison. So not a lot of time with him at all. So you know I gotta ask you what it was like to work with Bill Cosby. It was interesting. I liked yeah. him. He's a I liked him. Yeah, he was a yeah. good guy. I don't have anything know? negative to say about him. Yeah, that. neither do I. Yeah. I liked him. You know, mm -hmm. he was fun. He was funny. You know, so I had a good time. And Felicia, I know Felicia as well. Yeah, yeah Felicia she's... Rashad is awesome. Yeah. I, I'm actually a huge fan of her sister Debbie Allen. We're good friends. Oh, don't say that. Yeah, because Debbie I and I danced her. with George Faison. We were in this company together. And then she and I did Sweet Charity together, mm -hmm. and we're just really good friends. We, we live together. I didn't one. know that. Yeah. So am I like the only person that not only bought Special Look, her <laughs> debut album, but know every single song on the album? Wow. I love you must that be the album. Only one. 1988. Yes, yes, Special yes. Special Look. Yep. I can tell you the name of every song that came out off of that woman's album it broke my heart that it didn't do well yeah because um, i think as a, as a musical piece it was such a great piece but i know how record labels work and blah 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 blah. but yeah I, a huge huge debbie allen fan tell, right. her, tell her that she has one of the biggest fans from that special look album. i will i love I it absolutely i absolutely will love it. so now um with uh, i style management mm -hmm. um your premier client anwar overton he um what makes what's the spark? What is the what is what 
makes him have the it factor. Okay, well, I, I do a lot of scouting, mm -hmm. if I'm in me, and I happen to be, at that time, coordinator fashion show. Okay. And I saw him in the corner with the flute. With the flute, With yes. the flute. And mm -hmm. he, I said, you play flute? And he says, well, I do, but I don't. And, you know, I want to put it down because I'm like a little boy from Brooklyn and nobody mm -hmm. really plays the flute. And I wow. said, well, I think you should play. And I pulled him to the side and we started, you know, talking about me working with him. Mm -hmm. And... This young man is so talented, I guess he's never really been told or, but he's so talented and he has the natural ability to, um, uh, what is it, improv wow. on music, okay. which is a beautiful thing. Yes. He has the natural ability to improv and he knows music, he knows theory, he knows, he knows all genres wow. of music, but he was this young boy in Brooklyn that was you know, shielded or not right, able to, right. to really show his talent. But the it factor is that he's a, a, a performer. Mm -hmm. He's an all-around performer. When he hits the stage, he knows how to bring draw people in, you know, not only with music, but just personable with people. His charisma. His charisma. That's very important yeah. as an artist. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So when you're out scouting for talent, Allison, let me ask you a question. What are some of the things that you look for? There's something that you mentioned about Anwar uh, when you asked him, uh, you know, do you play the flute? And he's kind of, you know, reserved about it. Usually when I come across talent as a radio show host and they don't, if I ask them, can you sing? And they say, mm, that gives me an indication that you probably can't. Right. <laughs> so, right. I mean, you're, you, when I, when I uh, interact with artists, I always tell them you need to not be arrogant necessarily, mm -hmm. but confident. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? That's absolutely true because if you know arrogance is there's a there's a level of humility no matter how talented you That's are true. that you need to have. Right. You know. So it, it, you should. You should. Yeah. You know. Um, but what I read with him when he said mm, it was that it wasn't a lack of confidence. Mm -hmm. I I'm a mother. Right. And it was a need. Okay. And I I saw it, he hadn't been told how right. wonderful he was. And so I made him play for me. Right on the spot. On the spot, he played for me. And he was wonderful. He was wonderful. And so then the next opportunity I had, I said, you gotta hear this guy. And I took him with me to a show and then I took him to a band that I played with. Mm -hmm. And then I took him down to uh, Valley Simpson's Sugar Bar. Uh -huh. And, uh -huh, yeah, and I had him play bar. and then I said, listen, let's work together. Wow. And that's how that happened. What, what would you like to see um, happen with uh, with Edward, let's talk about him first. Yeah, I'd like to see him do a solo album. Nice. I'd like to see him, you know, stand out as an individual solo artist. So that would be like a jazz album. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, what advice would you give to artists? I don't like to use the word the term up and coming. Okay. Aspiring artists mm -hmm. um, who want to get into the business, whatever the genre may be. What advice would you give them? The first thing is that a dream is a goal with a deadline, period. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you need to really, you know, have your plan in, in order. Even if nobody's believing in the plan, mm -hmm. have your plan in order. And then you have to look at the quality of opportunities that are offered to you. Sometimes everybody says, it's money, it's money, but right. it's not always it money. It's not. So, you know, go ahead and take opportunities to expand your skill, even if it's not you know, paying you the way you want to be paid. Right. But expand the skill and, and build on it and build on those opportunities and a lot of networking, a lot of hard work. A lot of networking. A lot of networking and a lot of hard back. work. Yes. That's right. That's right. And just be open to, you know, continue learning. What about the, the idea that an artist should kind of spread their wings and, and, and maybe dabble in modeling and maybe dabble in acting? How do you feel about that kind of segueing into different things? Uh, just to, I guess, kind of get your name out there at the early stage? I, I, I have a feeling about that. I'm, I'm going to say that yeah. for myself, um, and, I, and I do pass this on to others, I was a dancer first. Mm -hmm. I was a solid dancer first. I made a name for myself as a dancer first, mm -hmm. and then it made it a lot easier to spread out. Right. So when you're all over the place, nobody knows how to market you, how That's to sell true. you. You know, who are you really? What do you really do? What right. are you good at? Right. You know, so it's not bad to do a lot of things because I still do a lot of things. But I think that you should be solid in something so that you have an opportunity to expand. From a person who really loves dance, I bet you this is a question you have not been asked very often. If you could pick one song, just one, what is the one song that you could dance to forever and ever and ever, over and over? That's a really tough one because I have to tell you I'm a dancer because I dance to everything. <laughs> I, I cannot I, sit that's, still. That's it doesn't matter fast or slow. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter the genre. So I don't have a specific song. If you could pick, what's your... 
pick one that that when it one song that when it comes on, you got to move. For me, it's The Pleasure Principle by Janet Jackson. Wow, it's tough. I'm going to tell you what came to my mind first. It's a song called You Bring Me Joy that was Anita Baker. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We love Anita. Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll say it, You Bring okay. Me Joy. And that's that's interesting because that's not even a fast song. That's a mid-tempo. Mid-tempo song. Okay. That's okay. because I was a ballerina first. Oh, see, I didn't know that. Yeah, I was a and ballerina. And now you know, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, well, it was great speaking to you, uh, and, and I got to learn so much about you just in the course of this conversation. I'm like, you're friends with Debbie Allen? Yeah, that's oh, my girlfriend. I love that woman. Um, and and you've, you've done so much. Where do you see yourself moving forward in your career with with uh, iStyle Management and all the other wonderful things that you've done. Where do you, what's tomorrow look like for Allison William Foster? My passion really is to give others or somebody an opportunity to have the experience that I had. Wow. A little black girl coming out of Harlem, out of the projects. Sharing is caring. That's yes. what it's about, you know? Yes, so I'm, my prayer is that I can open up the door for somebody's dream. Okay, and how can people reach you? How can people contact you? I'm all over. Okay, I style management, my mm -hmm. number or my Whatever Facebook. information you feel comfortable. Okay, I have, yeah. uh, I have an Instagram, which is at I style management underscore co. Okay. And I'm on Facebook, I style management on Facebook. Okay. And uh, I have a website, www.istylemusicmanagement.net. Are you looking for any new talent? I absolutely you am. You are? Okay. I am. Okay, so just know that Allison Williams Foster is looking for talent. Uh, her uh, her firm is called iStyle Management, and if this sister can't manage you, you probably are an unmanageable person because <laughs> she's done it all. This is Kerry D. Singleton. It's been an honor to have Allison Williams Foster on the show, and you're watching Pipe TV.